This week's episode is brought to you by $49sites.com. Use promo code NAKED to get a free upgrade to the Pro Package when you sign up. It was during this time he became acquainted with a young woman named Emma Hale. As so often happened, rumors preceded Joseph. Father's heard some stories. Well, what if I told you that they were true? I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. Blushing Bride, Mafia Wife. Episode 2 was the last episode we spent any real airtime on Emma Smith, and she's only been a passing mention at best ever since. Why? Well, Mormonism is a total boys club, right? I mean, everything in Mormon history was moved and influenced by men, and they really only dictated their own history through their own eyes. The women of Mormon history were present, but scarcely even mentioned in the history books. Most of women's influence on Mormonism is only learned of by reading through their own journals, of which there are far fewer than men's own dictated histories. But just saying that Mormon history was created by men, therefore the men are all we talk about, that's a cop-out on my part. The fact of the matter is I haven't put enough mental resources into learning of the women's role and impact in Mormon history. That's a failing on my part. Just as Mormon history as it's been created is fairly exclusive when it comes to women's roles, so has our examination of it. When the source material of history is largely created about the men by the men, women's influence is inevitably understudied and passively relegated to fringe studies of Mormon history. What can we really learn about history when we don't even consider the role of one half of the population in it? This is a struggle I've only recently become cognizant of, and I've been actively trying to rectify it. With that in mind, let's spend today talking about the elect lady of Mormonism and give her a proper treatment. Emma Hale Smith Bitterman was a force to be reckoned with. Through her 74 years of life, two marriages, nine children born, of which only three survived her, three and a half adoptions, at least 17 moves through five different states, never living in a single place more than three years during her marriage to Joseph Smith, multiple heartbreaking family deaths, and countless trials and errors. Emma was truly a remarkable human being. The plethora of documentation we have of Joseph Smith allows historians the ability to construct complex and diverse narratives of his personality, often, of course, with motives to view him through a specific lens of being the pious prophet or just a charlatan. And the truth of the matter is never sufficiently captured and likely wildly underrepresented in every biography of the man. For historians, Emma, however, is a darkly one-dimensional help me to the prophet of the restoration. This isn't a lacking in historical analysis of her so much as a lacking in source documentation to begin with. She left almost nothing behind. 22 letters between her and Joseph survive today, and a few letters that she wrote after the schism grenade are known to be extant, but she left no diary or journal, she never had a personal scribe or a planning book, and much of her personality is only understood through peripheral mentions in letters and diary entries that weren't about her whatsoever. It wasn't until she was unanimously elected president of the Relief Society of Nauvoo that her personality begins to shine through in the minute books, kept by her close friend and secretary Eliza R. Snow, with whom she had severe later disagreements. The one-dimensional historical portraits of Emma have largely been clouded by her status. She was the emotional support for the prophet until his death, but later became an outspoken enemy of Brigham Young. 
coloring her LDS portraits to be two-faced or out of focus in an effort to minimize her overall role in Mormonism. On the other hand, she raised the prophet of the reorganization, and our LDS sources have painted the holy and pious narrative deserving of wife and mother of the true Mormon prophets to an extent that leaves her true humanity utterly detached. The real Emma Hale isn't somewhere in the middle of these narratives. For that, the narratives would have to be better defined in order to be dichotomous. She was a fascinating and dynamic character of Mormon history, and I've found that even her best biography, Mormon Enigma, is woefully lacking in representing who the true Emma Hale Smith Bitterman was. Such is the constraint of sticking to facts and historically verifiable truth. The historical record of Emma Hale only plots a few monumental points of her life, while the rest remains speculation based on those scant few verifiable events and documents. So today I'm going to be relying heavily on Linda King Newell and Valine Tippett's Avery to discuss Emma as the book Mormon Enigma is an incredible biography and arguably the most comprehensive and balanced in the entire field of Mormon historical studies. Please understand this, though. I feel like even Avery and Newell leave a lot to be desired when postulating Emma's possible motives and true intent. Well, the book is constrained to a format which wouldn't ruffle feathers in the field of Mormon history, regardless of denomination. Seemingly, in spite of their friendly and very calculated approach, Mormon Enigma was actually banned in Brighamite Mormonism. This is from the introduction of Mormon Enigma, the biography of Emma Hale. Quote, The book offended the leadership of the LDS Church in Utah. In June 1985, a month after it received the Evans Award, newspaper headlines in the Los Angeles Times announced, now quoting the Los Angeles Times, Mormons forbid female biographers of Smith's wife to address church. Back to the introduction. We were prohibited from speaking about any aspect of religious or church history in any LDS church-related meeting or institution. Church leaders took this action without reading the book in its entirety or informing us of their decision, and it remained in effect over 10 months. In the wake of the national publicity caused by the ban, the sales of the book tripled, end quote. Why? Why ban this book? Well, It shows Emma in a light contrary to the simplistic, you know, silent and stoic helpmeet to Joseph that the LDS Church has been putting forward for over a century since her death. It also exhibits a level of inner conflict within the Smith family, much of it due to polygamy in the later years. It seems like the LDS Church was terrified to confront that aspect of Mormon history. Such a prominent individual in Mormon history and an honest and full-throated biography about her was banned. You know, Mormon history is nothing if not fun, coupled with equal amounts of drama and controversy. So let's get a refresher on Emma Hale prior to her meeting Joseph Smith. Emma grew up in a relatively wealthy household in Harmony, Pennsylvania, on the banks of the Susquehanna River. The descendant of Mayflower immigrants and daughter of a Revolutionary War veteran, Emma led a charmed life. Father Isaac provided for the family's comfortable living as an active hunter, and Mother Elizabeth Hale provided a pleasant home and education for her children, making side income by boarding strangers passing through Harmony or working jobs in the area or until the people could build their own homes in the largely uncultivated area of Harmony as it was, you know, kind of late to becoming colonized as opposed to its neighboring townships. In her earliest years, Emma was schooled by her mother, Elizabeth, as were the majority of the Hale children. But Elizabeth was quite well educated and was able to teach the Hale children reading and writing at a very early age, which elevated them above their peers. Elizabeth's role in the formation of Emma's mind cannot be overstated in this regard. Quoting from Mormon Enigma, quote, Though Isaac worked hard and steadily, Elizabeth also contributed to the family income. She opened her home to boarders, operating an inn or tavern to provide the family with extra cash to augment produce from the garden, farm crops, and meat from the wilds. She taught her daughters to make candles from tallow, cure sausages for the winter, and dry fruit from the orchards. They learned to knit and sew, to patch and mend. Quite likely, the results of their homemaking skills appeared as entries in the annual agricultural fair. End quote. By age nine, 
The town built its first schoolhouse log cabin. Emma and the Hale children began attending Caleb Barnes School Services and furthered their education. During Emma's late teens, an interesting occurrence happened in Harmony. Once again, from Mormon Enigma, quote, A distant relative of Emma's, William Hale, had approached Isaac with a peculiar story. Isaac, of course, is Emma's father. A woman claiming to have powers that enabled her to see underground had told William Hale that great treasures were concealed in a hill just northeast of Isaac's house. Persons with such powers were commonly called peepers, and many people took them seriously. William Hale began digging in the specified area. The work was slow and difficult for a man who had an aversion to hard physical labor. Not wealthy enough himself to hire help, yet sure there would be riches to share with a partner, he talked Oliver Harper into financing the dig. Harper's untimely death suspended the operation for a time, but exciting rumors about buried treasure still swept through harmony. End quote. And here enters Josiah Stowell, as we called him many moons ago, Boss Man Joe. Josiah Stowell was wealthy and believed Emma's relative when William Hale claimed that this treasure digging squire had told him of the buried treasure. Josiah Stowell, a resident of Bainbridge, New York, knew of a visionary family, well steeped in magic rituals who could peep the treasure and break the spell which bound it underground. Stowell approached Joseph Sr. and contracted to have him and a couple of his boys come down to the banks of the Susquehanna in Harmony and locate said treasure. The Smiths took advantage of the fair pricing of the Hale Tavern and boarded with the Hale family for a number of weeks while they searched for the treasure. During this time of boarding, Joe and Emma cultivated a liking for each other. It would have been a bustling home filled with treasure-seeking men looking to make a quick buck, while the Hale women provided meals, tightened bedding ropes, emptied chamber pots, and probably delighted the men with their beautiful voices for evening entertainment. Emma was noted multiple times throughout her life in other accounts as often humming or singing while she worked, and she must have had a beautiful voice to do so. Her musical acumen would serve her well in the church. Emma's primary task, and you know, a task which was repeatedly disputed over throughout her career as elect lady, was to compile the church hymnals at various points. In fact, the only revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants, and likely the only revelation ever given to a woman in Joseph's Mormon history, was directed at Emma. This is from the Book of Commandments, 1833 edition, chapter 26. This was given in July of 1830. Quote, It shall be given thee also to make a selection of sacred hymns, as it shall be given thee, which is pleasing unto me, to be had in my church. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart. Yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me. End quote. Not particularly well known or discussed in popular Mormon history circles was Isaac Hale's tacit involvement with the treasure digging and the entire Hale family's interest in it. As Avery and Newell put it, quote, Isaac Hale viewed the money digging activities with conflicting emotions. On the one hand, his farming experience taught him that the earth rarely harbored great riches. But when his neighbor Josiah Stowell believed peepstones could reveal hidden treasures and invested money in the enterprise, Isaac suspected Josiah knew something he did not. Both men were comfortably well off, but neither was wealthy. If Josiah Stowell found a fortune under Isaac's nose, the subtle social structure existing among the local farmers would be altered in Stowell's favor. It would humiliate Isaac if his lazy relative, William Hale, found a treasure. Isaac Hale guarded both his options. He allowed the money digging to take place under his watchful eye, but kept himself a respectable distance from the operation. End quote. When the treasure dig continued to grind on for weeks with only more dirt for results, as was often the case with these scryers, the blame fell to Joseph's shoulders, and Isaac probably harbored resentment or ill feelings toward Joseph from that time forward. This would taint their relationship and complicate matters between Emma and her parents. After the treasure digging was abandoned, Josiah Stowell hired on Joe as a farmhand, which gave Emma ample opportunity to spend time with Joe and continue their courtship. Eventually, Joe proposed to Emma. Isaac Hale gave a total and absolute no to the proposal, likely due to his observations of Joe's character during the treasure digging expedition near his property. Joe and Isaac's relationship continued to sour, and Isaac ended up famously hating Joseph Smith as Joe continued to steal away Emma for longer and longer periods of time. 
While Joe was a ranch hand for Boss Man Josiah Stowell after the treasure digging trip, Boss Man Joe's nephew-in-law filed a lawsuit, which resulted in Joe's 1826 trial, where he was called the Glass Looker by Justice Albert Neely. This development in the relationship between Emma's courtship partner and her father, whom she devotedly respected, must have been incredibly taxing on Emma. This conflict must have played into her decision-making process when she finally decided to elope with Joseph. After a second proposition and denial, Emma finally stayed home from church while the Hale family went to the local Methodist congregation. Joe showed up on the Hale family doorstep, you know, probably with like a boombox blasting what is love, and they immediately crossed into New York to the town of South Bainbridge and were married without the consent of Emma's father overwhelming trepidation, foreboding doom of familial kinship, you know, consternation. Really, who knows what it would have felt like to elope with somebody that your father despised. Beyond that, Emma didn't even return home after they married. Emma and Joe, after becoming married, headed straight for the Smith family farm in Palmyra, leaving behind every one of Emma's personal effects, every one of her cattle, and all of the furniture that she had accrued over her entire lifetime. She simply said goodbye to it all. It must have been a shock to arrive at the Smith home. You have Joseph Sr., Lucy Mack Smith, and then we have Hiram and his new wife, Jerusha Barden, Sophronia, who was being courted by a man to whom Joe Sr. was indebted for a land deed, Samuel, Crazy Willie, Catherine, Don Carlos, and Lucy Jr., all crammed into a cabin that was maybe 900 square feet combined on the two floors. So Emma went from a comfortable and educated living space with her own bed and her own furniture, sharing a room with possibly one sibling, to living in a house less than half the size with 11 other rough and uneducated people, all while being a newlywed and not even having said goodbye to her family and all of her worldly possessions back in harmony. We can't know what this must have been like. We can't possibly put ourselves in Emma's mind. She did cultivate a remarkable relationship with Jerusha Barden and Lucy Mack during this time, as they were the eldest women in the house to provide for all of the men of all ages. Lucy loved both her daughters-in-law, and Emma and Lucy would continue to be extremely close until Lucy's death in Emma and Lucy Smith Milliken's care in 1856 in Illinois. After receiving a letter from her father and the translation coming to a halt, Emma and Joe resigned to let's say, face the music and move to harmony. Joe received the greatest chastisement of his life, witnessed by a family friend when Isaac told Joe that he had stolen his daughter and that Isaac would have much rather followed her to the grave than to have seen them married. Isaac contracted with Joe to sell him and Emma her older brother's home on the Hale family farm. Emma finally had a home of her own, and Joseph and Emma moved in immediately. Part of the agreement was that Joe would give up the magic and the money digging business and he would work as a farmer in order to provide a sustainable home for his wife, Emma. And Joe may have for a very short time worked on the Hale farm doing manual labor, but soon his clever wit combined with profound laziness overpowered his desire to placate his father-in-law and work on the authorship of the Book of Mormon began in earnest with Martin Harris. Financially supported by not-so-smarty Marty Harris, Joe and the pregnant Emma had great hopes for their future. Authorship, or translation, whatever you want to call it, was progressing. Joe and Emma's first son, little Alvin, was growing inside of Emma. Then, tragedy struck. Not-so-smarty Marty lost the 116 pages, the Book of Lehi they'd completed, thus completely obliterating the financial prospects for Emma to have a secure home and family life and Joseph wasn't going to go back to farming life. Then Alvin was born completely deformed, living a mere few hours before he perished. And the labor nearly killed Emma. She was laid up in bed for weeks while Joe buried their first infant son and stayed by his wife's bedside, attending to Emma's every need, probably scared as she was that she wouldn't recover for the first week of bedridden nightmare fuel. It was good Emma was near her family at this time. They provided the emotional support necessary to grind through this very hard time in their early relationship. Eventually, Oliver Cowdery came to live with the Smiths to get the authorship rolling again. 
Emma was now feeding two hungry young men from any food they could possibly get their hands on. Because of Isaac's iron-fisted opposition to their marriage and the Book of Mormon, the Hales weren't providing any financial support for Emma and Joe, beyond just subsidizing the house that they were living in. Eventually, Joe and Ollie went the few miles to Colesville, New York, to petition a Smith family friend, Joseph Knight Sr., for supplies. When Joe and Ollie got there, they found that Joseph Knight Sr. was gone. When Ollie and Joe returned, they found Joseph Knight Sr. and Emma unloading supplies, beans, bushels of corn and potatoes, and plenty of other foodstuffs from the sleigh Joseph Knight Sr. brought down. This got Emma, Joe, and Ollie through the winter of 1828-29. to When supplies once again ran low, Ollie sent a letter to his good friend, D-Day David Whitmer, asking if they could come finish the translation up there. David Whitmer's reply was affirmative, as he wanted to see this marvelous work and wonder come forth from under his family's roof. Thus, Emma was once again uprooted from her family farm to accommodate Joe's whims. There's no telling what the Hale family relationship was like at this time. Undoubtedly, Isaac and Elizabeth Hale loved their daughter, and they wanted the best for her, but they simply couldn't agree with the life Joseph Smith was leading. Emma loved her husband, and must have been completely torn apart by the conflict between Joe and her parents. In June of 1829, David Whitmer showed up with a wagon to move Ollie and Joe along with some of Smith's possessions to Fayette, New York for a brief time, and Joe just left Emma in harmony. He just left her there. No reasoning why she didn't immediately join Joe and Ollie in Fayette. She was just stuck in harmony for a little while. Eventually, she did make her way up to Fayette for the final stages of the translation process. The copyright for the Book of Mormon was filed on the 11th of June, 1829, and authorship of the original manuscript was completed two and a half weeks later. Mm, Roughly. Emma and Joe, after the original manuscript was completed, moved back to Harmony onto the Isaac Hale farm, back to their house that Joe had contracted for with Isaac Hale, bearing the good news that the manuscript was completed. The Book of Mormon would be published soon. Ollie and others in Fayette toiled with creating the printer's manuscript, and, you know, unfortunately, the good news didn't smooth ruffled feathers, and Isaac still refused to support Emma and Joe during this time. Desperate for money, with supplies running extremely low, Joe caught wind of a rumor that Canada was buying copyrights for history books. He sent missionaries on two separate occasions to find a purchaser for the Book of Mormon copyright as it was being printed. Desperation to provide for a wife and fulfill an overdue $200 contract on the home in which Joe and Emma lived extended Joe to extremes. Undoubtedly, this would have been a challenging time for Emma and extremely strenuous on her relationship with her family. One challenging aspect of Joe and Emma's history cropped up, and we covered this in episode 21, One Prophet, Two Trials, Threesome, anybody. Joe was arrested and tried for being a disorderly person. When it found out that the court didn't have jurisdiction, he was released and arrested again on the steps of the courthouse to be taken to the proper courthouse that did have jurisdiction. During this second trial, bossman Josiah Stowell's daughters were called to testify against Joseph. They were asked explicitly if Joe had ever acted inappropriately towards them. And that was probably based on just rumors that were going around Colesville at the time. But for every false rumor surrounding the prophet, the truth was usually even more salacious. This is from Mormon Enigma, page 33. Quote, Between Joseph's trials, his lawyer, John S. Reed, rode up to see Emma. He said Emma's face was, quote, wet with tears and her very heartstrings were broken with grief. Back to Enigma. The local judicial systems were unable to convict him, but nevertheless, Joe had received rough and contemptuous treatment and had been persecuted for what he believed and taught. Dismayed and shaken by the ordeal, Emma and Joseph went quietly back to harmony, end quote. Not evidenced in the historical record is how Emma's interactions played out with her family at this time. You know, Who knows, but we can assume that everything from major fights or tearing at the fabric of familial ties down to very small microaggressions, evidence in subtle daily interactions, her relationship with her family degraded. None of the Hales would ever convert to the church. Further evidence of a growing chasm between Emma and her family is exhibited by developments after the church was founded. 
Hingepin Sidney Rigdon and Edward Partyboy Partridge made their way first to New York to meet with Joseph Smith and then to Harmony in order to meet the young prophet in the late summer of 1830. Joe agreed to moving the church to the fertile religious soil in Kirtland, Ohio. He delivered a revelation inciting the first Mormon mass exodus, and Emma was forever bound to life as the elect lady of Mormonism. This is from Book of Commandments, chapter 26, quote, Emma, my daughter in Zion, a revelation I give unto you concerning my will. Behold, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou art an elect lady whom I have called. Murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen, for they are withheld from thee and from the world, which is wisdom in me in a time to come. That's, of course, referencing the gold plates. It continues. And the office of thy calling shall be for a comfort unto my servant Joseph, thy husband, in his afflictions with consoling words in the spirit of meekness. And thou shalt go with him at the time of his going, and be unto him for a scribe, that I may send Oliver Cowdery whithersoever I will. And thou shalt be ordained under his hand to expound scriptures, and to exhort the church, according as it shall be given thee by my spirit. For he shall lay his hands upon thee, and thou shalt receive the Holy Ghost, and thy time shall be given to writing and to learning much. And thou needest not fear, for thy husband shall support thee from the church. For unto them is his calling, that all things might be revealed unto them, whatsoever I will according to their faith." When Emma and Joe finally arrived in Kirtland, she was pregnant with twins Thaddeus and Louisa Smith. The final migration to Fayette a few months before Kirtland was hard for multiple reasons. First off, from everything that had happened with Joe, you know, the plates and the Book of Mormon, his trials for disorderly conduct and the Stowell daughters, you know, testifying on the stand against him, the foundation of the Mormon church, all of these things, the relationship between Emma and her family was on the rocks, to say the least. When they departed for New York, Emma said goodbye to her parents for the final time. She would never see them again before their deaths. She may have seen her siblings after that time, but there's no historical record of it. It would be rational to conclude that this goodbye at the beginning of 1831 was her final goodbye to her family, and a sayonara to any semblance of her previous comfortable life. Other reasons for what made this move so hard are further discussed by Avery and Newell on page 35. Quote, Emma bade farewell to her parents. It was a difficult parting for her. She loved the peaceful Susquehanna, the lore of Ichabod's swamp and the hardwood forests. She had come back nearly two years earlier anticipating much. The baby who had stirred inside her then lay buried near the house. Hope for a reconciliation between her father and her husband had evaporated. Emma would never see Harmony, her mother, or her father again. Emma was pregnant again and ill. Her mother-in-law kept watch over her and noted that, quote, Emma's health at this time was quite delicate, yet she did not favor herself on this account, but whatever her hands found to do, she did with her might until she went so far beyond her strength that she brought herself a heavy fit of sickness, which lasted for weeks. And although her strength was exhausted, still her spirits were the same, which, in fact, was always the case with her, even under the most trying circumstances, end quote. If Emma hadn't been the emotional support to Joseph that she was, who knows how far Joe would have gotten in his life. During all their trials and tribulations, this description by her mother-in-law, Lucy Mack Smith, seems consistent among multiple accounts describing Emma. She was unflappable. She never made her own inconvenience an object of complaint to anybody. She always rendered help to others, even when it endangered her own health or well-being. Whatever it is she did at this time, it likely didn't do well for the twins she was carrying. Two months after her and Joe's arrival in Ohio, she delivered the twins prematurely. Thaddeus and Louisa lived a mere hour or two in agony and perished due to malformity. Once again, the delivery nearly killed Emma. But her physical illness was nothing compared to her compromised emotional well-being at this time. I mean, think about this. She'd now given birth to three children who didn't survive even one day. For a couple trying to become parents, this must have been absolutely devastating for Emma. 
Joe and Emma did have a close personal friend in the Murdoch couple. The Murdochs had just given birth to twins, which unfortunately killed their mother during the delivery process. Twins Joseph and Julia Murdoch's survival depended on having a nursing mother. Emma had just lost her own twins, but her body was biologically ready to nurse upon her recovery. So three weeks after Thaddeus and Louisa were delivered and passed away, Emma and Joe took in Joseph and Julia Murdoch to be raised as their own children. This was a great secret in Kirtland. Joe and Emma never planned on telling Joseph and Julia that they were adopted, instead opting to raise them truly as their own children. During a bout of measles, when Joseph and Julia were less than a year old, Joseph Smith was dragged out and tarred and feathered. When the mob dispersed and Joe returned covered in tar, Emma thought it was blood and she was sure that Joe was about to die. She fainted while the Johnson family dragged Joseph into the house and began cleaning him up. It should be understood that one of the possible explanations for this violent mob attack could have been due to Joe fooling around with Miranda Nancy Johnson, which explains why the mob attempted to poison and castrate Emma's husband until the doctor in the mob lost his nerve and didn't perform the mutilation. For some reason or another, little Joseph Murdoch Smith, 11 months old at the time, was exposed to the cold winter air. He suffered for another few days as his symptoms worsened and eventually he perished as well. That's three total births and one adoption in Emma and Joseph's guardianship who died before maturing, before even reaching one year old. We can't even fathom what this must have done to poor Emma, especially if we consider that the mobbing and resulting death of Joseph Murdoch were probably due to Joseph's infidelity with a 16-year-old that they were living with at the time. You have to admit, Emma had some incredible emotional fortitude to withstand all these severe buffetings resulting from Joseph's actions. Fast forward another two years after this mobbing, and we arrive to Zion's camp. In the interim period, Emma birthed her first child, which didn't die soon after childbirth. That's Joseph Smith III. Joseph III would eventually go on to lead the reorganized church starting in April of 1860, 16 years after Joseph Smith's death. The actions which led to the formation of Zion's camp were wildly complex, but suffice it to say, the Mormons had been removed from Jackson County in Missouri due to far too many issues we can't get into here. You're going to have to go back to episodes 28 through 33 to get the details of that. But essentially, the Mormons threatened the way of life of the Missourians, and the Missourians didn't take kindly to it. The Missourians mobbed the Mormons' property in Jackson County, they burned their printing press, and violently removed the Mormons from the county. In answer to this violence, Joe organized a Mormon militia of 205 armed soldiers and 11 women and a few children to help cook and clean during the journey. They marched the 800 miles from Kirtland to Missouri to redeem Zion by any means necessary. At least that was the initial intent. The whole debacle ended with no real violence, but a couple of armed standoffs. Joe delivered his Fishing River revelation, basically disbanding the militia, paying each soldier $1.14 for their trouble, and then Joe told them that they'd have to find their own way back home to Ohio. However, the rumors and headlines being printed incited so much confusion. The Mormon militia was eventually struck with cholera, eventually resulting in 68 people becoming sick with it, Joseph included, and 14 of those people died. The unsubstantiated rumors filtering their way back to Kirtland during the march must have caused chaos and discord among the remaining Mormons in Ohio. This is from Mormon Enigma, page 52, quote, What little news reached Emma in Kirtland was erroneous and slow arriving. On July 12th, the Shard and Spectator announced that, quote, a body of well-armed Mormons led on by their great prophet Joe Smith lately attempted to cross the river into Jackson County. A battle ensued in which Joe Smith was wounded in the leg and the Mormons obliged to retreat. Joe Smith's limb was amputated, but he died three days after the operation. Back to Enigma. Until word filtered back or Joseph arrived in Kirtland two weeks later, Emma may have believed him dead, end quote. With little Julia Murdoch being about two years old and young Joseph III being just over a year old at this time and a church of hundreds of members, financial affairs in Kirtland were in complete and utter chaos and Emma had no professional training to provide for her family should Joe experience an untimely death. 
What thoughts must have plagued her mind when she caught word that her husband had died in an armed battle? Her husband, by whose side she had stuck for the past seven years through so much trial and tribulation, was dead from his first Mormon military campaign, perished as a result of, quote-unquote, religious persecution? How could Emma go on? Needless to say, the, the pain and suffering and the physical and emotional turmoil that Joe put Emma through was something we could never wrap our minds around today. All we can do is look at the sequence of events and just try to sympathize with what it must have been like to live through these events without the historical hindsight that we have today. Emma was one of the Smith family. We can't forget that. She had forsaken the Hale family. She'd become a member of the Smith family when she said goodbye to her past life and joined the Smiths, first in Fayette and then in Ohio. Quote, After dinner, Emma went to a high council meeting with Joseph. That's right, women attending high council meetings in Ohio years. Weird. That's not the case today in the church. The matter of business was the trial of a couple charged with whipping their daughter unreasonably. Lucy Mac Smith began to testify about matters that Joseph believed had long since been settled in the church, and he objected to his mother's comments. William Smith rose and charged Joseph with invalidating her testimony. Joseph told William he was out of order and asked him to sit her down. Joseph threatened to walk out of the meeting, but Father Smith intervened and they returned to the issue at hand. The erring parents were finally reprimanded for raising a daughter who required the whip at 15 years. The Smith family fight did not diminish with the end of the meeting. Two days later, Joseph, William, and Hiram met at Emma's house to settle their differences. William said Joseph always tried to carry out his own plans, whether they were right or wrong, a charge Joseph regarded as an insult. When Hiram attempted to make peace, William rushed outdoors, bent upon vengeance. The argument upset Emma and the other Smiths two full months. Though the disagreement had begun over a relatively minor matter, the fury that sustained it came from a deeper source and would continue to disrupt the two brothers' relationship. A week after the argument with William, Joseph came home from Sunday services and scolded Emma for leaving the meeting before the sacrament was passed. His words brought Emma to tears. Quote, she made no reply, his history stated, but manifested contrition by weeping. Back to Enigma. But he apparently attempted to ease some strain for Emma. On October 17th, 1835, he called his family together, arranged domestic concerns, and dismissed his borders. End quote. Now it's from Mormon Enigma, page 55 through 56. Everything that happened with the Smiths happened to Emma, too. It was the only family she had. Her only sense of sisterhood came from the wives of other Mormon elites and the younger women the Smiths took into their home for Emma to teach homemaking skills. You may wonder, why would Emma need help around the house and, you know, take in so many women to teach these homemaking skills? Well, the truth of the matter is that Joe and Emma rarely ever lived in a home as just their own little nuclear family. Whether it was them living with other families like the Whitney's, the Johnson's, the Elder Smith's, the Morley's, and a number of other families, or Joe and Emma living in their own home and boarding other Mormon families who were refugees at various times, Joseph and Emma didn't have their own roof to live under. Whatever the case, Joe and Emma rarely had the privacy of their own home. Emma took these younger women into the Smith home, gave them room and board, and taught them homemaking skills that they would need when they eventually married and had their own home to make. Emma was always a giver and a lover of nearly everybody with whom she came into contact. The community reflected her love. The Mormons loved Emma. She wasn't just the elect lady, she was Mother Emma to hundreds, then thousands of people who needed to see a powerful nuclear family at the head of their religion to feel secure. When turmoil and so-called religious persecution gripped the Mormon populations at various times, whether in Ohio, in Missouri, in New York, or Illinois, Emma and Joe were always the picture-perfect couple leading by example. At least that's how it looked to the public. Their marriage was filled with conflict like any other marriage. Arguably, Joe's conduct brought about conflict Emma had to suffer through and deal with that most other marriages were insulated from. We're going to get back to Emma after a quick word from our sponsor this week, 49dollarsites.com. 
Last week, I gave everybody a call to action mid-episode, and that was to go to NakedMormonismPodcast.com and look at the old site that I built three and a half years ago so that you could all have a reference point for what a professionally built site looks in comparison. Well, everybody, I'm excited to announce that the new NakedMormonismPodcast.com is up and running. I've been working with the staff of 49dollarsites.com to get the site tweaked, adjusted, and built to be exactly what I wanted. Don't take my word for it. Just log into the site yourself and you'll see how user-friendly it is. 49dollarsites.com built the new website. They restructured the backlog and organized the history versus the interview episodes. They posted up all of the pictures that were taken on the uh, Mormon history tour, and you can download and use all those pictures free from a ton of Mormon history sites all across the country. 49 dollar sites built an amazing balance of pictures and text that are really pleasing to the eye. And most importantly, they made the website super mobile friendly. It looks great on a smartphone or tablet, and it retains all the functionality of a full desktop site. They fully search engine optimized the website, and they retained the search rankings from the site to make sure that it's just as visible in Google searches as the old site was. And I just want to share this with you guys really briefly. I've had an amazing experience in working with 49dollarsites.com. The project manager that was assigned to my project was extremely attentive, worked with me through dozens of emails and multiple iterations of the site and even a few phone calls to make sure that the site was exactly what I wanted. Their team was extremely professional and I can tell you from my own experience now that I'm going to be using $49 sites in the future for any website needs that I have. And what's even better, they maintain everything for me. I mean, I have spent hundreds of hours on maintenance and security with the old website, and now they do everything for me. I don't have to pay any mind to the website. It just runs perfectly and seamlessly. So if you need a website built for any reason, whether you're a small business owner, and especially if you're a podcaster, I know that there's a few podcasters listening right now, having $49 sites build your website is something you're going to kick yourself for not doing sooner. If you have a website that you want to look professional so people can take your business or podcast seriously, 49dollarsites.com is going to make that happen. And don't forget, if you use promo code NAKED at checkout, you get a free upgrade to the pro package. And that also gives a little bit of kickback to this show. 49dollarsites.com is stretching your dollars to give you an awesome pro site at the regular price, and it helps support this show. You can't justify waiting around anymore. If you need a website or your current website is like the old Naked Mormonism podcast.com. I mean, how, how do you describe that? Bleh. I, okay, just do it. Okay. Go to 49dollarsites.com and sign up. Don't forget that promo code NAKED at checkout, and you'll get all the extra pro features for the regular price. And even if you don't need a website right now, go check out the new and improved NakedMormonismPodcast.com, and you'll see what a professional website builder can accomplish when the time comes that you do need a really awesome website. So here are just a few of the features of the pro package that you'll get if you sign up now with promo code NAKED. You get a responsive web design optimized for mobile experience. And let's face it, most websites are accessed on mobile devices now. You get hosting, you get daily backups, search engine optimized website, engaging web content. You get Google Analytics, which is really, really useful. You get a photo gallery, a slider with a bunch of photos. You get promotional pop-ups. You have no startup costs, unlimited updates, access to stock images, a contact form, Every single thing you could possibly need for building a small business website, $49 Sites has you covered. From my own personal experience, they've helped so much. And it's honestly, it's been a pleasure working with their team. And I know that you're going to have the same experience when you finally decide to pull the trigger and have the professionals take it from here. Once again, visit 49dollarsites.com and enter promo code NAKED at checkout to get a free upgrade to the pro package. $49 $49 sites, the only way to build a professional website. With that, let's get back to the show. Fanny Alger moved into the Smith home, likely in 1834 or 35, in order to learn from Emma homemaking skills, like happened so frequently in Emma's history. Joe took a liking to the young woman. There's no way Emma couldn't notice this, okay? 
Joe had a track record by this point. Rumors of Eliza Winters, which was one of Emma's friends, just a few weeks after Joe and Emma had eloped, and public rumors about the Stowell sisters, which Joe stood on trial for, and then, of course, Joe being dragged out of the Johnson house in Hiram, Ohio, because of funny business with Marinda Nancy Johnson. You know, wherever Joe went, rumors of adultery followed. What happened between Joe and Fanny couldn't have been a mystery or really even a surprise to Emma at this point. According to William E. McClellan, in an 1872 letter to Emma's eldest son, Joseph III, when he was prophet of the reorganization, McClellan explained what happened in explicit detail, recalling an 1847 conversation that he had had with Emma. Quote, Emma missed Joseph and Fanny Alger. She went to the barn and saw him and Fanny in the barn together alone. She looked through a crack and saw the transaction. She told me this story, too, was verily true. End quote. Public rumors about the Fanny Alger affair, among other pressures like Joe stealing thousands of dollars from the Mormons through the Kirtland Safety Society Company, overwhelming debt as a result of the Kirtland Temple construction and dedication, rumor of Joe's commanding Mormons to assassinate a wealthy creditor in Kirtland by the name of Grandison Newell, and countless other reasons, Joseph had enemies. Kirtland became too hostile for Emma and Joe to remain. They fled in the middle of the night in January of 1838, headed for Missouri with almost no possessions and the three-story printing office in flames behind them on the horizon. Prior to their flight from Curland, Emma had taken control of Joe's terrible financial record. He'd woven such a tangled mess already and he needed some real help. Emma began to become more autonomous and powerful in organizing church affairs out of sheer necessity due to Joseph's absence. Quote, people who were convinced that Joseph had intended a swindle at the onset attacked him verbally and threatened him physically. This disruption forced Joseph to leave the city frequently. That's of Kirtland. As a consequence, Emma again took in borders. Whether they paid in cash or kind, the results benefited the family. In Joseph's absence, Emma earned their income and decided how to spend it. She bought, sold, bartered, and traded. Her letters to Joseph reveal that she wrote him as a business partner, clearly expecting he would consider what she had to say. She negotiated with men in solving her financial difficulties, and though she did not always succeed, she became a person to be dealt with, not ignored. End quote. While Joe was in hiding, he and Emma shared a brief letter exchange, which seems to exhibit thinly veiled frustration at his lack of personal wealth management and his need to leave abruptly without even saying goodbye to Emma. This is what Emma wrote, quote, I could not tell you my feelings when I found I could not see you before you left, yet I expect you can realize them. The children feel very anxious about you because they don't know where you've gone. I have got all the money that I have had any chance to, and as many goods as I could. I fairly feel that if I had no more confidence in God than some I could name, I should be in a sad case indeed. But I still believe that if we humble ourselves and are as faithful as we can be, we shall be delivered from every snare that may be laid at our feet, and our lives and property will be saved, and we redeemed from all unrenderable encumbrances. End quote. And her next letter exhibits her feelings even more explicitly. This is written a mere eight days after the previous letter. Quote, I do not know what I can tell you, not having but a few minutes to write. The situation of your business is such as is very difficult for me to do anything of consequence. Partnership matters give everybody such an unaccountable right to every particle of property or money that they can lay their hands on, that there is no prospect of my getting one dollar of current money or even getting the grain new left for our bread. As I sent to the French place for that wheat and brother strong says that he shall let us only have 10 bushels. He has sold the hay and keeps the money. Dr. Cowdery tells me he can't get money to pay the postage of the office. Brother Parrish has been very anxious for some time to get the little mare. And I do not know, but it would be your will to have him have her. But I have been so treated that I have come to the determination not to let any man or woman have anything whatever without being well assured that it goes to your own advantage. It is impossible for me to do anything as long as everybody has so much better right to all that is called yours than I have. End quote. This was the Panic of 1837 and the collapse of the Kirtland Safety Society Anti-Banking Company. Capital had completely evaporated, and creditors were waxing urgent on getting their dues collected. Where was Joe during all of this? 
in Boston looking for buried treasure. He was hiding out from everybody in Kirtland. I mean, that's a better explanation, but he'd been approached by his brother who told him about a guy who knew about where some buried treasure could be found in Massachusetts. So Joe took that opportunity to jump right on that bandwagon right out of town. On his return trip, Bloody Brigham met Joseph a day's ride outside of Kirtland and told him of an assassination plot by the Quorum of Apostles waiting for him upon his return. Joe thwarted the attempt by simply having advanced word of it happening, but Warren Parrish did burst into a meeting at the Kirtland Temple with an entourage of disaffected Mormons, holding the leadership at gunpoint, claiming that the church was in apostasy. These are the circumstances Joe was dragging Emma through. You have to wonder how often she was left at home while letters for Joe were piling up, people were knocking on the door every few minutes wanting to have a word with the prophet, three kids crying because the scary men at the door were yelling, all while Joe was in hiding. How often did Emma reminisce on her charmed life back in Harmony before meeting Joseph Smith and maybe even yearn for a simpler time? You know, to the public, Emma exhibited a stoic first lady of the highest regard, never voicing her personal wants, never engaging with the speculative dribble of gossip constantly circulating. Who was she in private? Who was Emma behind closed doors when it was just her and her children? What were conversations like between her and the prophet? Their midnight flight to Missouri resulted in them living with the Harris family. Not Martin Harris. Joe had sucked that money fountain completely dry, and Martin Harris remained in Kirtland, part of the Mormon congregation which had excommunicated Joe. This was the Harris family of George W. and Lucinda Pendleton Morgan Harris. Joseph's diary recounts the situation as Joe, Emma, and the Smith children, Julia Mardock, young Joseph III, and Frederick Granger entered Far West. Quote, On the 14th of March, 1838, as we were about entering Far West, many of the brethren came out to meet us, who also, with open arms, welcomed us to their bosoms. We were immediately received under the hospitable roof of Brother George W. Harris, who treated us with all possible kindness, and we refreshed ourselves with much satisfaction after our long and tedious journey. That was read from josephsmithspolygamy.org. Lucinda Pendleton She was the widow of the infamous William Morgan, who had published his expose of masonry in 1826 and went missing soon afterwards in the custody of Masons. During the two months Joe and Emma lived with the Harrises, Joe courted Lucinda and took her to wife. Emma, in a time of a dire situation like their lives being threatened, forcing the Smiths abruptly to flee to Missouri— Joe found time to court a new wife in the same household as he, Emma, and the kids were living in. The historical record can't prove whether or not Emma was aware of this burgeoning relationship. Biographers claim she was completely oblivious to the majority of Joseph's wives, and there's no way to unequivocally prove otherwise. We do know, however, that she was aware of at least seven of his more than 33 wives, and tacitly granted her approval of his taking some of those women. The majority of those seven wives historians know she was aware of were younger women who were living in the Smith home as she was teaching them homemaking skills. The year of 1838 in Missouri resulted in the Mormon War. Joe, Sidney Rigdon, Hiram Smith, and a couple dozen other Mormons ended up in Liberty Jail or Richmond Jail, while the Mormon exodus from Missouri to Quincy, Illinois was being organized by the remaining Quorum of Twelve who weren't incarcerated. Bloody Brigham Young, along with Emma Smith, were at the forefront of this organization effort, thus elevating both of their status in the community and garnering due respect for their tireless efforts in moving thousands of Mormon war refugees hundreds of miles with minimal casualties. While Joe was interred in the deplorable conditions of Liberty Jail, Emma made a number of visits to see her husband, sometimes with Joseph III, other times alone sometimes staying a day, other times staying two days. Joe was in Liberty Jail awaiting a jury trial on charges of arson, robbery, and high treason against the Union for inciting the Mormon War and aggressively attacking a state militia. Should his conviction go through, Joe and friends faced the gallows. This ultimatum must have been a dark cloud over Emma's visits. What do you say to your spouse when there's nothing you can do to help him and he's facing the death penalty? 
Did they talk about the cold weather? Did they talk about how fast the kids were growing up? We, we can't know. A few letters passed between Joe and Emma during his time in Liberty Jail, and they are extant today, and they reveal a profound heartache of Joe to return to his family and an overwhelming sense of worry on Emma's part. During one of these visits, while the gallows awaited Joseph Smith, young Joseph III was brought in, and Joe pronounced a blessing on his head that he would inherit all the keys and blessings bestowed on his father. In later years, young Joe didn't remember the details of this blessing, just that it had happened and it was never recorded. But historians know that it happened from accounts of the other men in the jail when the blessing occurred. This would play into effect upon the schism grenade going off after Joseph's death. Eventually, it came time for Emma to pick up what little possessions she could along with the kids and move from far west Missouri to Quincy, Illinois. She and others took great pains to preserve information for the benefit of historians today. Quote, While Joseph was imprisoned, his scribe, James Mulholland, had stayed in Emma's home and kept Joseph's papers. When the local men became unruly, Mulholland gave the papers to his sister-in-law, thinking a woman might escape search. Now quoting Ann Scott, quote, Immediately on taking possession of the papers, I made two cotton bags of sufficient size to contain them, sewing a band around the top ends of sufficient length to button around my waist, and I carried those papers on my person in the daytime when the mob was round, and slept with them under my pillow at night. I gave them to Sister Emma Smith on the evening of her departure for commerce. End quote. Back to Mormon Enigma. The Mississippi had frozen over before Emma arrived. Fearful of the thin ice, she separated the two horses, put Charlie on her wagon, and trailed Jim behind. Then walked apart with two-and-a-half-year-old Frederick and eight-month-old Alexander in her arms. She had Julia hold tightly to her skirt on one side, positioned young Joseph on the other, and, with the heavy bags of Joseph's papers fastened securely to her waist, Emma walked across the frozen river to safety. Of this trek, she later wrote, now quoting Emma, No one but God knows the reflections of my mind and the feelings of my heart when I left our house and home and almost all of everything that we possessed, excepting our little children, and took my journey out of the state of Missouri, leaving Joseph shut up in that lonesome prison. But the reflection is more than human nature ought to bear. And if God does not record our sufferings and avenge our wrongs on them that are guilty, I shall be sadly mistaken." End quote. That was from Mormon Enigma, page 79. What an amazing human being Emma was. Four children, a couple of horses, and a wagon with a few small provisions, none of their furniture or creature comforts, and two heavy bags around her waist of Joe's papers, which would have proved him guilty of treason and fully deserving of the gallows, thus the close guarding of them. All of that for hundreds of miles in the dead of winter to get her and her family to safety in Quincy, Illinois. Wow. Thousands of Mormon refugees poured into Quincy, Illinois and the surrounding areas. Living out of wagons and makeshift shacks haphazardly constructed from a few felled trees, these people became ravaged by sickness and malnourishment. Emma took on the role of medicine woman, administering to the sick and waiting by their bedside at the cost of her own health and sanity. Joe and Emma continued to exchange letters while he languished in jail prior to his escape. He sent an epistle to the church on March 21st, 1839. What's particularly remarkable about this epistle is that Joe asked that Emma read it to the congregation. Not Brigham Young, who was essentially second in command in the area. Not Sidney Rigdon, who'd been released on a writ of habeas corpus and was acting president of the church in Joe's absence. It was Emma who read the epistle to the saints, commanding them to compile bills for what they had lost in Missouri, which Joe eventually presented to the president of the United States, Martin Van Buren. Once Joe finally escaped from Liberty Jail, the scenario of Joseph and Emma's reuniting is absolutely incredible. Quote, A disheveled traveler leaned against the side rail of the ferry with his head turned away, 
Ragged pants were tucked inside old boots full of holes. He wore a blue cloak with the collar turned up to hide his face, and a wide-brimmed hat drooped down over his unkempt beard. His skin was pale and his body wasted. Dimmick approached the ferry as the man guardedly raised his hand. "'My God!' Huntington exclaimed. "'Brother Joseph, is that you?' Alarmed, Joseph hushed Dimmick and immediately asked about Emma and the children. Huntington explained that they were several miles away and asked if he did not want to find his parents first. Impatient in any delay, Joseph insisted, Take me to my family as quick as you can. Dimmick located a second horse and Joseph slouched in the saddle to avoid detection as they negotiated the back streets of town. Joseph did not realize the Mormons could hold their heads up in Quincy. As they approached the Cleveland house, Dimmick hung back suspecting that a reunion worth observing might be at hand. Emma glanced through the door at the stranger stopping at the yard and recognized him before he had time to dismount. She ran through the door and was in Joseph's arms before he was halfway to the front gate. End quote. After a year-long war, so many trials, five months of internment in a horrible jail with deplorable conditions, Joe suspecting that he had been poisoned and fed human flesh, Emma moving the family and their few possession hundreds of miles through the dead of Midwest winter, sickness ravaging every camp of Mormons, thousands of people destitute with nowhere to turn. Emma and Joe were finally reunited. What a reunion it must have been for Dimmick Huntington to watch. Emma and the children were living with the Clevelands in Quincy, and Joe was glad that his family was cared for by a few trusted Mormon elites. The Clevelands would eventually have a plot in the city of Nauvoo adjacent to the Smith homestead before Joe and Emma moved into the Nauvoo mansion. And to add a little more color to this, Joe would also eventually court Sarah Cleveland to become one of his wives. The relationship was likely cultivated during this time when Joe and Emma lived with them. And really, this was a recurring theme from day one with Joe and Emma. They would move into a wealthy Mormon's house, and it wasn't long before Joe was sleeping with one of the women there. In 1832, with Marinda Nancy Johnson, Fanny Alger living with the Smiths in 1835-36, to Lucinda Pendleton Morgan Harris in 1838, Sarah Cleveland in 1839-40, to and the list goes on and on and on. All of these relationships cultivated right under Emma's nose. She had to have known. You know, we can't know what it was like, but if historians today are able to pick out these patterns, how could Joe's own partner not pick up on them? Regardless of the polygamous relationships Joe was cultivating throughout his career as prophet of the Restoration, Emma just kept being the picture-perfect First Lady of Mormonism, homemaking, administering to the sick, sewing clothes, or anything else duties dictated her to fulfill her time. Now from Mormon Enigma, page 86, quote, When the cool fall air killed the mosquitoes, the malaria gradually decreased and Emma turned her attention to bringing some order to her house. She took in two young girls, Julia and Sevilla Durfee, to work for her. Julia as a seamstress and teacher, Sevilla as maid. Emma's kitchen duties were probably similar to the other women's. They dried fruits and vegetables and cured meat. They wrapped rock-hard maple sugar loaves and hung them from the rafters in the smokehouses, then hammered off small pieces as needed. Most of the milk was made into cheese, which drained from cloth bags or perforated buckets hung from tree limbs or rafters. Kitchen utensils were simple homemade wooden cutting boards, rolling pins, spoons, and dough boxes. Emma might have beaten eggs with a whisk made of birch twigs tied together. A ringer and washboard always stood nearby. For clothing to be very clean, the white things were boiled with homemade soap, making wash day a day-long affair. End quote. Page 86, Mormon Enigma. So many things we take for granted today. I mean, think about that. Homemaking was truly a full-time job. Emma continued to take in the sick and weary, often giving her own bed to the sick and needing, leaving her and Joe to sleep on the floor in front of the fireplace. She never ceased singing or humming while she worked. William Holmes Walker recounted, quote, I arrived at his, Joseph's, house about nine o'clock, just as his family was singing before the accustomed evening prayer, his wife Emma leading in the singing. I thought I had never heard such sweet, heavenly music before, end quote. From Mormon Enigma, page 89. This book continues to surprise me with how dynamic it makes Joe and Emma. 
we find stories like this on page 90. Quote, One morning, as Emma prepared breakfast, the family heard a hesitant knock. Young Joseph answered the door. A black man named Jack stood waiting to see the Mormon leader. When invited in, he said he preferred to wait until the meal was over. Jack had lost one arm just below the elbow when a cannon discharged prematurely during a 4th of July celebration. The illness and fever that followed kept the man from working, and he had used up all his savings. Now he stood before the smith's door and explained that he could not get work because he looked so shabby. Joseph brought out a handsome buckskin suit that was his pride and gave it to the black man, who soon found a position on a steamer. Long before the suit wore out, he pressed payment for it on Joseph, who refused to accept it. The suit had been a gift, end quote. The giving and humble nature of Emma Smith shines through in a number of pleasant stories like this that really humanize Joseph and Emma. They were the power couple the Mormons needed to be the standard bearers of Mormon society. But we can't forget that they were human, just like you and me. They had flaws, desires, complex emotions from anger and frustration to love and tranquility. Joe's habits also can't be ignored here. He was always on the prowl for women who were susceptible to his status in the community. His insatiable urge to be with as many women as possible was constrained by the logistics of public scrutiny, requiring him to invent novel solutions. Quote, During the spring, Joseph constructed a large room on the back of the homestead. A great fireplace in the north end allowed the extension to be used as a kitchen and two original rooms became sleeping quarters. Try and picture this. A special retreat lay hidden under the house. Partway down the steps leading to the cellar, Joseph cut the timbers bearing the steps, then hinged the stairs so a couple of them could be lifted forward. This gave entry to a small vaulted room with a dry brick floor and bricked walls, large enough for two people to occupy, either sitting or lying down. End quote. Yes, Joe built a non consensual immorality room in his house, right under Emma's nose. Sure, it was used when he was hiding from authorities when they were trying to arrest him, but we have to understand the primary purpose for this secret room under the stairs of the Nauvoo homestead. That's where Joseph consummated marriages. Just prior to this room being constructed in the homestead, Emma and Joe took in the Partridge sisters after the death of their father, Edward Partridge, in May of 1840. Emma would eventually consent to Joe taking the Partridge sisters to wife while they lived in the Smith home. She knew that Joe was sleeping with the Partridge sisters, and he was probably using this little secret room underneath the stairs to consummate those polygamous marriages while Emma and kids were on the other side of the secret entrance. And you know, we've fallen victim to this in this episode, but any discussions of Emma often devolves into what her views on polygamy were. Was she okay with it? How many wives did she know about? Was she bitterly opposed to it but stuck in her marriage with the prophet and she couldn't control her husband's urges? As we'll see in coming episodes discussing the Relief Society, of which Emma was unanimously elected president, polygamy was constantly a rumor factory that Emma had to deal with. Rumors of adultery eventually led to the dissolution of the Relief Society and the assassination of the prophet. All of this happened with Emma in full view of what was happening, even if Joe was able to conceal the majority of his marriages from Emma. Often absent from conversations about Emma and Mormon polygamy is the possibility that she may have been willing and consenting to some extent, but then Joe just took it and ran with it. You know, it, it's a controversial stance, but maybe Emma and Joe were just free love people and Mormonism was a bit closer to the free love society as many anti-Mormons painted it back in the day. On the surface, Mormonism was a unique restorationist Protestant Christian cult, but behind closed doors, who knows what real Mormonism was like? Maybe Emma and Joe together enjoyed the company of other couples after the candles went out from time to time. 
Maybe Emma gave Joe a hall pass and he gave one to her at some point, and then Joe just ended up abusing that privilege to the point that everything got out of everybody's control, even his own control. And then I'll be the first to admit that claiming Mormonism was a sex cult, among other things, runs counter to the majority of the evidence available to historians. It goes counter to the Victorian culture's view on sexuality and reproduction, and it definitely runs counter to how Mormonism and Mormon history are largely interpreted today. But we're basing our perception on extremely limited data. This line of conjecture that Mormonism was a free love cult is based on my own conclusions that Joseph and Emma were anything but conventional in their day. I think they were progressive in many ways, and I don't think that they held to the standards of sexuality that 19th century America society dictated, and that ruffled a lot of feathers. Emma's involvement and consent to polygamy isn't binary. She didn't either completely approve or completely disprove of it. Personally, I believe that she consented to some of Joe's marriages, and Joe took it a thousand steps too far. I think they were both caught up in the drama and controversy that polygamy and rumors of adultery stirred. Emma finding love letters from Eliza R. Snow, her own secretary in the Relief Society, on Joe's person, and her possibly pushing Eliza down the stairs, causing Eliza's miscarriage of her only pregnancy, that didn't happen in a vacuum. I think Emma knew full well that Eliza and Joe were in love, and at some point early in their relationship, she may not have had a problem with it, as she was very close friends with Eliza Snow. But to see your primary partner growing closer to another person in a poly relationship can cause a lot of jealousy, and it's one of the main breakers in poly relationships. Whatever we think was going on behind closed doors in Nauvoo, we can never actually know. The sparse record of polygamy and open relationships in Mormonism is based solely on the scant bits of evidence historians can collect about it. Whether Emma consented to many of Joe's poly relationships or whether she herself had multiple partners, it's impossible to know, and it's even harder to bend the scant available evidence to fit such a narrative. I recognize that. This is speculation for the purpose of adding some depth to the historical character of Emma Smith and possibly approaching the subject with a different set of nuances. Whatever Mormon history truly held, we can never know for sure. We also shouldn't reduce Emma to the blushing bride mafia wife, as is so often the case when she enters the sphere of historical discourse. These one-dimensional portraits painted of the historical Emma provide a lot of insight, but she's so often reduced to a few platitudes of her character without much nuance to add personality to who the human being Emma Hale Smith Bitterman really was. And for what it's worth, we spent a fair amount of time in our examination of Emma today talking about Joseph's polygamy. She's often inextricably tied to her husband's sexuality, which isn't fair. We've tumbled into that same pitfall today. So let's conclude by adding a bit of depth to Emma. Moving forward, as the church body she was responsible for, the Relief Society, continues to develop and grow. Emma was a remarkable and amazing human being. So I'm going to leave you with a few more snapshots into her personality to close us out for today. These are all taken from Mormon Enigma based on quotes from the original sources. During these months, Emma faced the challenges of domestic life. Her growing children sometimes displayed a streak of independence, a rightful inheritance in that family. Once Julia watched one of Sidney Rigdon's small daughters get what she wanted by banging her head on the floor and kicking the furniture, Julia decided to try the same approach. Don't you go Lacey Rigdon on me, Emma scolded and picked up her child from the floor. After John C. Bennett had found another place to live, he still took many of his meals at Emma's house. Young Joseph recalled that his mother would set a loaf of bread in front of the fire until the end was toasted brown, then cut off a thin slice and replace the loaf. Thus, she prepared Bennett's supper of toasted bread and milk, quote-unquote, just as he liked it. Emma and the wives of other distinguished officers often accompanied their companions on parade. One woman later wrote of Emma's fondness for horses and said she, quote, could manage them well in riding or driving. 
Many can recall seeing her mounted on horseback beside her husband in military parade, and a grander couple could nowhere be found. She always dressed becomingly, and a riding costume showed off her shapely figure to the best advantage. And one final quote of the description left behind by Emmeline B. Wells. And I think it offers a wonderful picture of the elect lady of Mormonism. Sister Emma was benevolent and hospitable. She drew around her a large circle of friends who were like good comrades. She was motherly in her nature to young people, always had a house full to entertain or be entertained. She was very high-spirited, and the brethren and sisters paid her great respect. Emma was a great solace to her husband in all his persecutions and the severe ordeals through which he passed. She was always ready to encourage and comfort him, devoted to his interests, and was constantly by him whenever it was possible. She was a queen in her home, so to speak, and beloved by the people, who were many of them indebted to her for favors and kindnesses. That does it for our proper introduction of the elect lady of Mormonism. Stay tuned for many more instances where she is going to influence our timeline moving forward. Just a couple of announcements as we uh, close out the episode for today. Just wanted to remind everybody that um, we appeared on God Awful Movies for Joseph Smith, Prophet of the Restoration, back on episode 145. If you want to listen to that, uh, you'll find a link to it in the show notes. It was a really good time just taking that whole movie apart it's such an aberration to all cinematic history and it was really fun to to really tear it down so um if you want to listen to that i I did tell everybody about it last week but just want to give you a reminder you can find that in the show notes and if you joined us here from god awful movies welcome and i hope you are enjoying the show with that we have a couple of new patrons to thank we have nathan jake and paul brand new patrons who gain access to a whole bunch of exclusive content over on patreon.com slash naked mormonism so to nathan jake and paul thank you so much for pledging to support the show and for all of those who do support the show you can join us on our namo home evening now the namo home evenings are our monthly google hangouts that we post up on youtube so you can watch it during and post in the comment section or if you are a supporter you'll see a link to the hangout that you can actually join us in the hangout and field questions to our special guests every month if you would like to join us you can check your patreon email beginning at 5.50 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on June 18th. That's going to be our next installment of our Name a Home Evening. We begin promptly at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You'll get an email if you're a supporter at 5.50, 10 minutes before, where you can join up on the Google Hangout. This month, our featured guest is Phil Ferguson of The Phil Ferguson Show, a podcast all about money from a CPA who constantly deals with money. He is going to help us navigate through the $32 billion Mormon leak that recently came out. We're going to walk through a bunch of the nuances, exactly what it means that the church controls $32 billion in basically hedge funds. Phil Ferguson is going to offer us a bit of insight into that as well as field uh, any other questions related to religion and money that any listeners or myself may have. So if you'd like to join us for that, you can join us on June 18th. That is Monday night, this upcoming Monday night, uh, once again at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you are a supporter on Patreon, you're going to get a link to join us in the Google Hangout itself. With all of that, thank you so much for listening, and I will talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast. Yeah.
This podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager, Natalie Newell as production assistant, Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer, and Andrew Torres of the law offices of P. Andrew Torres as legal counsel. Music is provided by Jason Camo of alawstateofmind.com and used with permission. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes LLC, copyright 2018, all rights reserved.